I can see a couple of you. Okay. It, it's best to be on Bert because <laughs> he's very animated, so we want you to be <laughs> able to say him. <laughs> animation! <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got an intro. <laughs> Recorded live at Talks and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. From the Talks and Tastings Studio, I'm Bullhagen. I'm Berg. I'm Vicker. And I'm Bert. And Peter's here. Hey, Pete. So last time we had one and a half pastors. Today we have three and a half pastors and a producer. So um, good to have you all with us. And uh, uh, I hope uh, um, our associate producer is doing, continuing to do well with their new child. You know, I would like, we have a little insight on that it was not the normal birth. From what I I saw. so abnormal birth. I mean, go ahead. Well, I just thought maybe if she's listening, because when I when you talk about interesting stories, you don't necessarily, as a group of men, want to. It's something that you want them to be able to share with. <laughs> that's uh, that's fair and safe. I think yes. That could be a big clerical error. So yeah, you know, it's one of those things. Like when you walk into the maternity ward. I mean, of course, we can't do this anymore until COVID's over. But you know, you walk into the maternity ward as a pastor after somebody's had a baby, and you're like, "This is awesome. This is so great. I get to look at this newborn child and talk about baptism with these people, and and uh, schedule the baptism. Hopefully, <laughs> they're in the hospital. Mm-hmm. You know, but it's it's kind of a non male place. Uh, and uh, and I remember when I was actually. When my not when I was having a baby, when my wife was having a baby, I think that's the point, right? Um, it was sort of like I was I was intruding on a foreign country where I was not supposed to be. I mean, does anybody ever have that feeling, that thought when you're no, in? kind of like Berg at an LWML you. meeting? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, yeah, yep. <laughs> I'll admit I was always I was always met with gazes of shock, gazes at, of shock at how well I was at handling kids. Oh, yeah, yeah well, you know, well and. Uh, you know, like in the old days, I, I've got I've, I've got uh, parishioners who they up until even like thirty years ago, they would just drop their pregnant wives off at the, on the sidewalk and they'd walk into the hospital and uh, and they'd they'd leave. And then tell me come, when you're done. Yep, <laughs> that's. It sounds terrible, but that that is the way it was. Uh, you know, and and I mean it it. Uh, um, my goodness. Uh, you know, back in the day, I mean, you had the, pet, the the doctor coming over to the house to help deliver the baby, or maybe just the midwife, or mm-hmm. maybe just the mother of the future mother, or the mother, you know what I mean? Well, you know what, I think, like, around here, uh, you talk about those times, since almost everybody was on a farm. You had to get back. Don't get me right. wrong. And, and, I mean, you were used to calving, you're used to... <laughs> well, and... and... <laughs> Convalescing. Well, you grew up on a farm. You know what I'm talking oh, about. I do. You were, were you born in the home, weren't you? No, I was not <laughs> born in the home, uh, <laughs> or in a barn either. Um, the uh, the the thing too is that convalescence has really gone down too. Like back 50, 60 years ago, a woman would spend seven to ten days in the hospital, and that was yeah. actually a huge thing in in Western uh, Western Europe. Like with Peter, Peter, when he was born, um, from the time she walked in to have the baby to the time she went home was less than 24 hours. So that's walking in, giving birth, and then going home all within 24 hours. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. For, so yeah, it's, and it, but now at least they give them two days usually. So yeah. Um, th- that's why, you know, women used to convalesce for so long. That you actually had a special rite that's even in TLH in the Lutheran Hymnal Liturgy, uh, a prayer for the churching of women um, after they would come back from such a long convalescence um, to give thanks to God for the birth of the child and for the health of the mother and the like. So I would like to, if Hannah, if you'd like to come on, since this is how we generally communicate, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to come on and and talk about uh, your beautiful new child, we'd love to to do that. So. Yes, and I'm sorry if I felt the way about it, I did about the maternity ward. I'm 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 over it now. So just yeah, <laughs> Peter, you can cut that out. <laughs> oh, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, so, uh, so as far as our, beverage, our beverages, I've got just the water. 
we're in a morning episode today. Uh, Vickers got his uh, Pepsi. Yeah. We got a diet A and W over there, and Berg's got a water. So, mm-hmm. what do you have, Pete? I'm just grabbing my uh, Voodoo Ranger Juicy Haze IPA. Ooh. Ooh. How was that? Since you got the only one with a real drink, how was it? Well, I'm not usually an IPA guy, but the juice really cuts into it. It's pretty good. Mm. I'm an IPA guy. I used to be. My dad really likes IPAs, but he likes the original Voodoo Ranger, not the not the hazy one. I've tried to get him a whole bunch of different uh, um, variations because they they've got a whole bunch of variations of those. And uh, but he prefers the original. And you know, after our last podcast, if you've listened to it, which Berg never does when he's not on, um... <laughs> I do like to hear the sound of my own voice. <laughs> I actually did go back and I listened to the preaching one. And okay. that that was a lot of fun, actually. Yeah. I heard that one, too. I thought that was great. Yeah. But the uh, last one was just Vicar and I. I complained that since I can't have beer right now, the sparkling water, you can't get a 12-pack in one flavor. I kind of went a little bit of a rant on that. I got pretty uh, pretty hot. You want kind of a mix and match so, so you can get a whole bunch Peter, of Peter, I noticed well, on behalf of the Clerical Errors podcast filed a complaint with Walmart. Would you like to explain yourself, Peter? Yeah, I mean, you know, we can't be having these subpar drinks. You know, they're not going to change it unless we tell them that they're doing something wrong, right? Yeah, so, that's true. So I meant, I sent a message to customer support at whiteclaw.com, uh, and, and it re- reads, I was perusing your website this morning and noticed you don't sell a 12-pack of just lemon or just lime flavor. I buy your products from Walmart, and... I can only find flavors I want in variety packs. This is a major issue for me, as I don't enjoy all the flavors of their variety pack. I just want, and this was a quote from the podcast, lemon, lime, and maybe a little grapefruit. How can I solve my issue? They they uh, haven't gotten back to me. <laughs> all right. So, so, so if the Waltons are listening, get on the ball. Well, I would say, well, he was to White Claw. So what I like for the... The, on my behalf, if the clerical errors army could all <laughs> register the same complaint, and maybe we can change. We can make a real change for the better for our world. <laughs> they can't even write in and give us feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We have to scour the internet for questions. Come on, listeners. Hey, by the way, Oklahoma, last couple of weeks, number two. Oklahoma has gotten their act together. Not Not enough to my liking. I think they could do better. Did, but, did we put an ad in? in no, Oklahoma I don't something? know what it is. I think it was maybe probably a Pastor Chris Christian's family, like like everyone oh, in his right. congregation, downloaded it. I hear the that they probably got the word out. They probably got word out to uh, what was the guy's name, the trucker guy. Yeah, that you know wasn't really coming. They probably got a hold of him, and then he spread it around the country. Right, and uh, you know. So that's why our numbers have been really up. Right, yeah. Our, our number numbers of listeners in Oklahoma has tripled. So. To f- three? It's, yeah, if you actually listen to that interview, you would actually be laughing right now, Bert. I, I'm sure I would. I'm sure I would. <laughs> Everybody else seems to be busting a gut, so. Yeah, no, um, I heard that he has the fastest growing church in Oklahoma right now. Is that right? Yeah. The, yeah. How does he do it? You gotta listen. You gotta listen. Okay. We should check in on him sometime soon. Yeah, again. I needed. I need to. I have more of that interview that I have to play. Yeah, see how he's doing. But all right. So we should actually talk about what we're preaching on at this point. Um. So, uh, uh, gentlemen, what are you preaching on? I'm preaching on probably. I'm preaching on the epistle reading for this coming we're, Sunday. This is Advent one. Advent one. Yes, but. Uh, the gospel reading is from Matthew twenty-one. So we're so first Sunday of Advent, and the reading is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So this would be Jesus the, riding. Pal- yeah, in, this is Palm Sunday. Yeah, riding in on a on the, donkey. Yep. Hosanna, Hosanna! Mm-hmm. Spreading the palm branches as Jesus enters Jerusalem. Now, Berg, what is the thought press of, process of having that for Advent? Our King is coming. Advent means coming, right? That's that's actually the Latin meaning of the that's the right. meaning of the latin word advent yeah adventus. right yes. i mean you heating vent that's the same thing that's your warm air comes through the vent yes yes it does so i'm glad i could add that for the listener 
that is a, a cognate, well, and the weather guess, is yes. getting colder, so everyone will be sitting by the heat registers. So, yeah, I'm a little amped up today because I actually finally post COVID got to work out for the first time yesterday. So I bet that felt good. Yeah, I wouldn't say I was clanging and banging, I was more clinking and dinking, but <laughs> it'll get there. You know, for the first time since breaking my ankle, I actually averaged over 10,000 steps a week um, for the first time. 10,000 steps a week? Yeah. No, it's 10,000 <laughs> steps a day for the okay. week, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I get yeah. 10,000 steps a week going to the fridge and back. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I guess that'd be so 70,000. Yeah. With, uh, with your new with your uh, non-wheat diet as well as, uh, I'm sure, losing weight during your COVID times, are you down on weight at all? Yeah, I was... Well, I was Skin taking it lo- slow because I, <clears throat> you know, when you're an elderly statesman lifter, you can't just, like Jonah, he can just, my son who lifts with me, he can just jump right in. I got to not tear pectoral muscle, you know, I got to ease my way back into it. Plus, I don't quite have my energy for that kind of thing quite yet. So, our text. So, it is Jesus entering into Jerusalem as the king. And I, I like it because it's a kind of a joyful way of starting Advent. I remember when I was a first pastor preaching on the three-year series, um, the three-year series ends with like three weeks in a row of, of end times. And then, and then I, I remember... Advent, which is all about that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And then and so I was finally, oh, good, I'm done with that. And then I'm ready to start something different. And then, all right, we were at Advent. And guess what the readings were? <laughs> Yep. All about Jesus coming again. So, yeah. Which is a very important topic. I mean, it certainly is. And I mean, we, we should we should look forward to this. This is what I'm going to be preaching on, actually, uh, from Romans chapter 13. I'm going to be talking about how our salvation is near now than when we first believed that this is coming. You know, I mean, uh, we oftentimes, as we just live our lives, you know, we, we forget that uh, the end of the world is coming and that it's going to be a good thing for Christians, you know. Um, it would be judgment and salvation, yeah. So as you can tell, um, listener, we have not done a lot of work <laughs> for us. <our> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but we're working on it. Ferg, you've been quiet. Well, I actually have all my sermons written up till December 20th, so... Oh! That's what I did with my quarantine, so... Wow. So what are you preaching <clears throat> on, then? I'm preaching Since on uh, Jeremiah 23, 5 through 8... Mm-hmm. I start my sermon off with a recap of the life of the prophet Jeremiah, um, how he was born in the last years of King Manasseh, whose actions basically damn Israel to exile and destruction, uh, how he began to prophesy during the days of King Josiah, which means that um, Josiah's great reformation of the church was only skin deep, and then how everything just goes to heck after uh, Josiah dies and his sons take over. And and we know that Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Uh, there's a lot of judgment in his preaching. But the text that is appointed for, uh, or recommended or suggested, because Old Testament texts aren't traditionally a part of the one-year lectionary, uh, for, Sunday mor- for the reading of Sunday morning, um, there's actually a lot of hope here. Um, we uh, see that there will be a righteous branch, this righteous sprout that shall come from David's lion, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely. Um, And in his days Judah will be saved and Israel shall dwell securely. Um, This is very, very important because, as we know, a lot of Jeremiah's prophecies are about how Israel is going to be destroyed, taken into captivity. Their kings are terrible, terrible. they are unrighteous. They build their homes on unrighteousness. They refuse to pay their workers. Uh, these kings are going to die donkey's deaths. And yet, in the midst of all of this, uh, we have this wonderful prophecy about a righteous king who is coming, who will actually execute justice and ju- judgment for his people, who will save them rather than scatter them, who will uh, give them security rather than, um, uh, rather than despair. Uh, and we know his name. His name is Tzikedu. It's a new, right? The Lord is our righteousness, which, if you know who the last king of Israel is, Zedekiah? Zedekiah. Yeah. Right? And yeah. what is the what does Zedekiah mean? Zedekiah means Yahweh is righteous, right? Right. Uh, yeah. And yet he lives a very unrighteous right. life. He is a very poor and twisted and distorted reflection of what our Lord is supposed to be. 
And so Jesus is our true Zedekiah. Hmm. That's cool. Like and, that. and that ties well with um, the gospel reading. With then. the humble king who the comes. The humble king, because he's. you see that from the beginning of, of Advent, that this king is different. He's riding on a donkey. He's... Um, Which really isn't that different. Um, there's a lot of Old Testament parallels here because Solomon, when he's going to be coronated, rides on a donkey. Mm-hmm. He, ro- he rides on uh, David's mule, right? Um, so there are just so many images and pictures here about who this king is. And he's not only hearkening back to the one who's greater than Solomon, right? Solomon did this, and now one greater than Solomon is here. Not only was... Uh, Zedekiah supposed to be this and wasn't. Now one greater than Zedekiah is here. Um, and, but And he's come to do this. Uh, and how does he save his people? Not through strength of arms, uh, but by delivering them from their sins. All right, that's a good way to, to continue on to our next segment. We have an update from Rawlings, Wyoming. Good morning, clerics. Coming to you live from out here in the windy, cold west. This is Baldwin giving you another behind a newly minted collar update all right finally finally he fixed the audio problem (laughs) it does sound like he's in a basement but uh yes at least he's not in his um bathroom i was gonna say office doing paperwork but yeah (laughs) good so it's uh, only 7.30 in the morning. Figured I shouldn't start off with anything too exciting. So we've just got some good Dakota roast coffee uh, from the Black Hills, actually. My parents mailed to me. Good stuff. So, And um, I know Bullhagen will be crushed, but I've unfortunately misplaced the trivia book. So that's not a thing anymore. So I've got kind of two things that have come up um, to give you a look at behind a collar. The first, so today it's blowing snow sideways out there. Um, makes me think of about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, um, had a member who gave me a call shortly after church on Sunday and uh, said, hey, pastor, um, we uh, we can't make it back to our house. They've closed the roads and we don't know what to do. This, uh, this particular member is pretty new and it just so happens she was passing through and her sister and good friend were with her as well. And they, you know, they really didn't know anybody in town. And they weren't sure what to do. And fortunately, we're blessed here at our parsonage uh, with a, almost like a spare bedroom suite downstairs. And so we were able to say, hey, well, you know, you can hang out here till maybe they open the roads. And if they don't, which they didn't, you know, you're able to spend the night here and uh, get up and try again in the morning. So, you know, part of being a pastor learning very quickly is it's not just... Um, writing sermons and, and leading Bible studies and that kind of thing. But, you know, there's there's things like this of... of um, you know, trying to um, help out those whom God has, uh, you know, placed under your care in in ways that might not seem obvious at first. Yeah, that, that definitely. I mean, that's that's like being hospitable, right? That's what we're supposed sure. to do. Yeah, yeah. And 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 note, make sure you check to make sure your safety deposit box is still there. And <laughs> right. Well, yeah, do that. But you know, be hospitable though. Open your door to people. You know, and and uh, let them come into your home. Yeah. Don't be like Procrustus. Yeah, Procrustus, the Procrustean guy. What, what is this about? Oh, well, you know, so uh, I've been reading a lot of uh, Greek myth here lately, and Procrustus was a guy, and he would invite you into his home. Oh, and, oh right. And the, uh, and the myth, it kind of goes two ways. There's one where he had a certain kind of bed, and if you were too short for it, like me, he would stretch you out. Right. And if you were too long for it, he chopped off your feet. Sounds like a perfect all fit situation. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, he was hated for this because um, this is the opposite of what Greeks were supposed to show. They were supposed to uh, show uh, xenophilia, the love of strangers. They were supposed to be hospitable. And St. Paul says the same thing, right? That we, mm-hmm. that especially pastors, not, but not just pastors, but every Christian ought to be hospitable, as Hebrews says too, right? Because uh, uh, we might entertain angels unawares. Like Lot did. Well, that, that's, you know, he probably learned that because uh, it's kind of a well-known fact that uh, when we have someone kind of wandering into town with a, you know, a backpack, you know, saying, I'm I'm on my way to, to Nebraska, um, which is generally how it goes, um, 
I send them to the vicar's house and, and they stay with the vicar and his family. So that's probably where he learned it. Great. Indeed. Well, you know, he does, there is a basement suite down there. Yeah. I mean, there's a throne. Yeah. The, uh, the coolest bathroom in town. <laughs> I hate to say it, but there's no room in the house right now. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of a, a, an initial thing there. The other thing I've got is, um, so I've got to start teaching a new member class. Um, and that is especially for, you know, a brand new pastor and we're a small congregation. So it's not like we have any sort of formal program or anything. Um, so kind of, oh man, what, what, what do I need to teach this guy? What does he need to know before I, you know, he can become a confirmed member of the church. And, and, um, you know, it's, it's places like this where you give thanks that, uh, there's so much good stuff that's been handed down to us. Um, in this case, you know, Luther's small catechism, right? I don't have to try to reinvent the wheel as I'm going, well, what are the basic truths of the Christian faith to teach this guy? I mean, here it is. People who are uh, much, much smarter, much wiser than I have put this together, both, you know, Luther with the uh, the original catechism itself, and then over the years, many um, additional people have, have uh, supplemented it and provided additional scripture references and, and that sort of thing to help explain it. Yeah, you know, that's really awesome. Um, I was just thinking about this because it's sort of like a tangential thing. Uh, but uh, I heard that there are some really important people in, like, people that they call influencers. I don't know any of them, really. I mean, like, uh, well, guy, actually, Kanye we are West. Kind of, we're kind of an influencer. Oh, in the, you're influencer? In, in the, <laughs> well, I know you. The so North Central can't be Iowa, Missouri Synod podcast market. Right. We right. are. Right. You, you, are you are a power behind the throne, Bullhagen. Yeah. But you know, like like these these influencers, like this guy Kanye West, and there's this other guy, Justin Bieber. I, I don't know. I don't know who these people are. I think they sing or do something. Maybe they dance. I I just don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, apparently, they're Christians, and uh, and I think it'd be a great thing for people to send them like one of those pamphlet v- v- versions of Luther's Small Catechism, you know, and say, hey. This is the basics of the Christian faith. Here you go. Check it out. Tell, tell me what you think about it. Or maybe make a, I don't know, a country song. Is that what Kanye West sings? Country? I don't know. A- anyway, <laughs> a rap song about it or something like that, you know? And uh, and Justin Bieber can, you know, move his hair around and read the catechism, and that'd be great. So. Well, we did have... We did have... A, a weird obsession with Kanye for a while. I, I kind of just want to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, it, it worked out really well. Um, we're ex- talking about the, the third article of the Creed, where we confess that it's the Holy Spirit who calls, gathers, and enlightens the church. So he's the one who grows the church, not not us. And I'm able to tell this guy, because uh, he's there, because he was in a different town, never went to church, and just so happened that he started working with the pastor's son on, you know, their job. And they were together a lot, and uh, the pastor's son started talking about the faith a lot and essentially brought this guy to the faith. He started instruction there, and then he's moved here to my town, and so I'm continuing to teach him. But I can point to that and say, look, it's not because we sent out flyers or had any big evangelism programs or whatever. I mean, this is the Holy Spirit. You, he guided you into our doors. Um <laughs> really, you know, I didn't, I haven't done anything. Um, we're just here, you know, to preach and administer the sacraments and the Holy Spirit brings people to us. So that was really um, a, a good, learn, teachable moment. There we go, a teachable moment. All righty, clerics. Well, that's what I've got for you. And we'll be talking to you later. This is Baldwin signing out. I'm wondering, maybe you can get back to us. I wonder if he's on the same route from Oklahoma. <laughs> that- oh. Just out of curiosity, because it sounds like it could be the same guy. Anyways, but Peter, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Do you find that experience a lot at where you work, when people find out that you're a pastor's son? Do you get all of a sudden like deep questions? I I do, uh, and that's I've got one guy specifically that tends to. But I've but I've, I've noticed that is if people will say, well, they're they're afraid to talk to a pastor about it, but like a pastor's kid. Something about it. So I'm you've had that experience, too. I have. Yeah, I've had that experience, too, actually. Nobody talks yeah. to me anymore. I, I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to say, I wasn't a pastor's kid growing up, but before coming to seminary, I had coworkers doing that as well. 
I had one in particular, every time I'd walk into, you know, his, his work area, he, you know, he'd ask, you know, is it a sin if, and then insert whatever you want there. And I'd always have to stop. It's like, okay, if you start your question, is it a sin? It probably is. It is a sin. And you shouldn't be asking this question. That's pretty good. Yeah. I like that Vicar. Yeah. Um, that actually, that, that as a brilliant, you just gave me a brilliant idea for a new segment. Is it a sin if? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I can come up with different scenarios, and we can determine right. whether it is a sin or not. <laughs> right. I'm a huge <laughs> fan of this. <laughs> good. Good. Like, yeah. Is it a, how I treat the vicar? Is it a sin <laughs> if? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Baldwin. We got four pastors on this thing now. This is awesome. I, I just the the immensity of our our acumen is. <laughs> Staggering. Filling, uh, staggering, yes. All right, so next segment. Uh, what it is, what it ain't, and what it could be. Peter, play the intro. What is it? Who knows? We do. It's time for what it is, what it ain't, what it could be. This is a, a simple one. A real uh, real simple one. And it is um, kind of going, going off of what we just talked about. Is good works. What is a good work? What it is. It is defined by God and his standard. Vicar, what do you think I mean by that? Uh, probably that we're basing the definition of good work off of Scripture and God's morality as opposed to my emotions. Yeah. Or something else. Um, and I, uh, Luther has a very good quote on this. I think Berg will like this quote. Okay, he's probably heard it before. Uh, if you could but save the world by one sermon and yet have no call to preach, desist, for you are breaking the true Sabbath and it would not please God. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, you might say, well, well, look how effective the sermon was, but was it according to God's will? Was it someone who was preaching who should be preaching? No. The ends don't justify the means. Right. Right. Yeah. And th this is a hard thing for people to understand, but I mean, it is true. The ends do not justify the means. Um, you can't, you know, you, you just you just can't uh, um, say, hey, you know, um, this is going to be awesome. Let's just do it. Uh, but you, you you have to you have to say, do I have a call to do this? Is this part of what I'm called to do? Now, I would say that there are people that are called to do certain things like in their home, right? Like fathers are called to teach the Word of God to their children in their home. And that is a good work. God does desire that, you know. So do it, fathers, you know. Um, and if, you know, um, mothers, if, you're, if your husband doesn't, uh, doesn't do it, then you do it, you know. Uh, but uh, my goodness, you know, uh, he's right in saying that, uh, that my goodness, if, if you're not called to preach or teach, then don't do it. Right. But but the but the, the the greater point is this, is it might seem right, it might seem noble, mm -hmm. you know, you have the the best intentions. Yeah. But it, but it, when it's defined by God's word, it's it's different. This is why you know we have a lot of sci-fi enthusiasts in this room, excluding I'm maybe so one. Lonely. <laughs> um, but sci-fi gives you a chance to do uh, thought experiments and. There's actually this one, uh, um, oh, what was it called? Uh, Doctor Who episode where they go back in time and try to kill Hitler, you know? Um, and think about that. I mean, it's an interesting thought experiment. Like, if you could kill Hitler before, what, 1933, right? Before all of this, before all of the horrors of World War II happened, um, would you be justified in doing so? And not just because of the un, because once again we're talking about unintended consequences, right? So, oh, it would be bad to kill Hitler because then our technology, then we wouldn't have TVs in our home, right? Or, um, or you know, something worse might have happened, really is, or might happen, right? Right. Um. So is that the way we use hypothetical? You know, is that the way we base good works on, as opposed to evil works? No. 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 Right. It's still evil. To murder someone. Right. Right? Uh, the act in and of itself 
of killing someone before they've done something wrong. And if you don't have the office to do so, that's evil. That's a sin. And, and that discussion, that, that, that interesting discussion is, it's kind of what we're doing with what's happening with abortion. Are, you know, that's one, one thing that I think our younger people realize is that they have, there's a lot of people of their generation that aren't here. A lot of people that mm-hmm. they would know who aren't around just because, because of abortion and it changed in a way the course of history. So yeah, in ethics we call this the difference between deontology and uh, um, utilitarianism. And your great buddy Spock, right? Mm-hmm. The what's the that's the phrase he always says. The good of the one, no, the good of the many outweighs the good of the one. I have to right? remember my... And that yeah. is the teaching of utilitarianism, mm-hmm. right? That you can justify just about anything as long as it benefits... The many. The many, the majority, mm-hmm. right? That steamrolls any sort of rights or privileges that a minority might actually have. It's like, get in line because, you know, for this brave new world... Uh, there's actually a great uh, there's actually a great book done by uh, Ursula K. Le Guin. It's called uh, The Road to Omalas. You guys should all try to get it. It's a very short story. Omalas is this perfect place. Okay, uh, everybody's healthy, everybody's happy. Uh, it's beautiful. Um, but the, the the secret here for this happiness is that they keep a child in a dungeon, suffering all of its days. And one of the ways in which uh, they uh, a part of the rite of passage for all of these people is that when a kid reaches a certain age, they bring them down to look at this child. And they're not allowed to comfort this child or talk to this child. The child has to continue to suffer for Omelas to prosper. And so the story ends with most people making peace with this and going on to live their successful lives. But if you actually leave Omelas and go to the West... Mm. So, I mean, this it really gets down to the question of um, do we base our good works on consequences, on the chance of success? Do we base good works on um, – because otherwise, if that was the case, Stephen should have never gotten up and preached. Right. Mm-hmm. Do we simply do things because they are right and because God commands them, or do we do it because we think there's a chance of success? I think oftentimes we get caught up in that sort of headspace too. So. Right, and that that's kind of a defining defining thing. That that's a good some things to think about when you're you're wondering, as, as Vicar does. Is it a sin? <laughs> All right, uh, what it is? A good work is only done in faith in Christ, and according to the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Right. You know, so like, there's a whole lot of works that you could do. You could say. I believe, but I do a lot of these crazy things against the Ten Commandments, right? You know. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. like, what, like, what would be an example from church history on this? Oh my goodness, uh, the Crusades. <laughs> you know, De- especially those Crusades that were against Christians. Deus fault. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Uh, that's something we're we're learning about uh, a lot. The Albigensian Crusade and the. Uh, the Crusades. Well, those guys were super heretics. Though. I know they were. They were. Unfortunately, True enough. unfortunately, in southern France, there were also a lot of innocent people who got, <laughs> who got killed. Know, yeah, who yeah, got yeah, killed because yeah. of it. They were super heretics, right? You know, and yet, is is it the best thing to to take out heresy with the sword? You know, uh, Prob- probably not. Probably not. Probably not. I think that sets a bad precedent. Yeah. And then, then again, uh, well, as a vicar at supervisor, that would also set. that would solve a lot of things. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that uh, that's yeah. why they burn them. Right, because the church can't shed blood. Oh, so right. So it's like a runaround on their own law. <laughs> I see, I see. Yeah, so yeah. the point I was thinking about when I wrote this, I wasn't necessarily to talk about, you know, killing people with swords. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> I was thinking of the fact that, you know, in faith you are alive. In Without faith you are dead in your sin, and you cannot do anything that pleases God. So it is right. impossible for a good work to be done outside of faith. I've uh, got a member. He has a really hard time with this concept that um, unbelievers do not do good works. Hmm. They don't. Right. They 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 cannot do good works. And then they and then but oh well you know they 
love their family and they are good citizens and civil they do this. And that's the distinction, right? You can be civilly righteous, but none of this it is actually, and this is the greatest thing, is that Christianity doesn't just condemn those outward coarse sins that we all know and are ashamed of. But what does it say about our own righteousness? Filthy rags. Yeah. And the the Hebrew there gets a little more graphic, right? Christianity doesn't just condemn our sins, but it even condemns the best and the brightest stuff that we hold dear, whether it be our reason, our tolerance, our whatever. Amen. Mm-hmm. That's right. And and that's the thing. It lays everybody low. It puts Gandhi and Mother Teresa in the same place as Adolf Hitler and um, Tamerlane. And if you don't know who Tamerlane is, you can quickly Google him. So, And Innocent the Third and Genghis Khan. Yes. Yes, those guys too. All right. They so, will be holding hands on the way to hell. There you go. <laughs> apart from the justifying faith <laughs> in Christ. That's a great title, Peter. Holding hands on the way to hell. I like it. <laughs> and skipping. <laughs> All right. What it is. The value of good works is given by God and not the world. We kind of touched on this a little bit, Mm -hmm. but uh, a true good work may not be valued by the world. You know, it may not offer worldly success, but the value is given by God. I mean, just think about pastors. Like, I mean, oftentimes we don't even value our own good works that we do, right? (laughs) We, you, you get done preaching a sermon, and it's like, man, this, I mean, obviously this was a waste of time. I had an experience sort of like that this past weekend. I, You know, I love my people. I love every one of them, and uh, I, I want them to hear God's word. And there are times I get done preaching a sermon, and I'm thinking, I, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm just, just thinking it's just, ah, I'm done, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever feel that way, you know. Uh, but then God is gracious to me too, you know, and uh, and uh, um, gets me along. Um, but yeah, it's good. Sorry. No, yeah. I mean, you know, you think about it, and it's like, man. Uh, well, you said it earlier about um, Peter, right? That uh, oh, he actually produces something for our economy, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that that is the way our flesh thinks, right? It's like, what do we what do we actually do? Okay, so we talk. We pray, which is just more talking. Right. We do these things, which it's a lot of talking, a lot mm-hmm. of yapping, and not a lot of happening, mm-hmm. or at least it seems like it, right? Um, and, and, and our flesh wants something. It, we want some sort of like something to say, okay, I did this, right? Right. right. Like, put up this shelf, <laughs> you know? And when one year looks kind of like another year, and another year looks like another year, and you're like, okay, well. Right. And so, but nevertheless, God says what, what we do is a good work. And and uh, also on the same note, uh, when you think of the doctrine of vocation, being a father, a mother, a friend, a neighbor, um, you know whatever your earthly vocation may be, too, mm-hmm. you know, given to you by God, God to do that also is is in the same vein where at the time of Refor- the Reformation, when a good work was locking yourself up in a monastery and fasting, and a, and good work was, you know going on a pilgrimage or so basically you've been living the monastic lifestyle yeah you lock yourself in your home for eating because potatoes. of covid eating potatoes yeah <laughs> hilarious well and um, the, the, yeah, the, we should yeah. i should start a new lutheran like a martian monastery you should just potatoes and, and a and a weight bench like first locked lutheran in a room. monastery on mars i can see it now i can see it now and then we can send the pastor from Roswell to be the first district president of uh, of the Red Planet District. There you go. The All right. Red Planet District. Uh, what it is, a good work flows from a willing spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what I mean by that is it, because it flows from the gospel, it, it flows from a, a love for God and a love for others. Not just do I have to, which is a selfish endeavor, you know, what do I have to do so that I get what I want? It is a good work because the Jesus himself in the Old Testament sum up the commandments with love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
So a good work comes from a willing spirit, which is why as if you go to a, a Lutheran church, a Missouri Synod church, you don't hear us banging on the pulpit telling people to give more money. Um, mm-hmm. Usually, I mean, we do talk about, you know, that money. We need it, but we don't. We don't like do it from like a demanding. You have to give this amount to be a member or anything like that. We want it to come from a willing spirit. Right. So, and if you want to know more about that, because we also say that good works are necessary. There's a whole great dis- discussion on that in the Book of Concord, mm-hmm. in the Formula of Concord on uh, what good works are. So take a look at that, too. So, good works, what it ain't. What it ain't. <laughs> a good work is not measured by good intentions or personal devotion. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, so in other words, let's say someone's really devoted to something that they think is good, but it isn't necessarily according to Scripture. Or sometimes people say, well, it makes me feel good when I do it, so it must be a good work. Yeah, sincerity is not the benchmark of good works. Right. Because Muslims are super sincere. Mormons. Mormons are super sincere. Jehovah's Witnesses are super sincere. Lutherans? (laughs) (laughs) Well, this is, God has great mercy on us. Right. That's exactly it. Um, and, you know, it's it's all this... Uh... Speaking of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> they must hate it during this quarantine because they know everybody's home, but they can't go knock on the doors. <laughs> I, I actually got got a letter from them. I know. A handwritten I, letter. I, me too. Uh, they're trying to earn their salvation by now <laughs> handwriting letters, I suppose, yeah. All right, what it ain't, good works. Simply being guided by your conscience. Uh. Because, which is, I think, a lot of times what people do, but our conscience can be, be corrupted, and it is corrupted. Right, we need God's word to come and inform our conscience, to sharpen it and to tell us what, what God's, you know, what God's will is. And then, then we can, uh, we go by God's, God's word rather than by just how we feel about things, right? Yeah, I had a case like that where there were some people who were like, oh yeah, you know, God wanted us to move in together because she sold her house so quickly. <sighs> Very sad. <laughs> All right, what it ain't. Uh, good works isn't simply obedience to human norms. Okay. What I mean by that is, uh, um, well, like, if we think about our current modern situation, you know, there's a lot of things that people tell us is supposed to be good and right, which isn't. Like ratting on your neighbors? Ratting on your neighbors if they're wearing a mask or not. Or holding Thanksgiving. Right. And all those things where... Going to church, right? I mean, there are states where the casinos are, like... Nevada, the casinos are open, but the churches are closed. Yeah. Wicked. Mm-hmm. Right. Amen. It kind of yeah. reminds me, too, of I, one of the things that I probably has gotten most reactions I've said in a sermon in the last few months was when I said that the um, remember the Sabbath day is actually a commandment. Like, oh, I guess I never really thought about it that way. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's not the third option. It's it's the third commandment. Right. God actually commands you to hear His word. Right. Um, what it ain't. Good works. Going above and beyond what God's word says. Mm-hmm. Which is often can often if you if you go in the way of measured by personal devotion. That's what the Pharisees try to do, for example. Pharisees, Rome, yeah, Lutheran Church, sometimes, mm-hmm. Pietists, Pietists, um, most council and voters meetings. Hey, vicar, what's a Pietist? A uh, Pietist would be someone who, very similar to the Pharisees, acts like they are holy, 
like they are following the law, the commandments, and doing good works as an outward show that they're really a Christian. They're a super Christian. But it's all a show. And they look to the works as the justification, as, as the, uh, uh, the evidence that they're a Christian rather than to Christ. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that's what pietism does. You know, and we all have a little pietist inside of each of us, and uh, it also comes out with uh, the way we think about shame, too. You know, um, how, uh, how shame, you know, it, it can sort of be a good thing where, you know, uh, uh, if, if we have the Ten Commandments, you know, we, we hear them rightly, we will repent of our sins, you know. But Judas also had a lot of shame. And he didn't. He didn't uh, have the repentance that leads to life. You know, Peter, on the other hand, by God's grace, um, uh, you know, he uh, met with Jesus, or Jesus met with him, and and came to him. Um, anyway, it's a little different. Um, but yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, we, we we think that we can justify ourselves, and our shame is part of that, and it shouldn't be. You know, we we should just we should just look to Jesus and His cross and and remember what He has done for us. Um, but any time I say we should, we should, I'm bringing us back into that pietism, aren't I? <laughs> Pretty heavy. I, it's, Sorry. It's like your favorite yeah. Disney hymn, right? Let it go. Let, let it go. go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So good works, what it could be. And this, these are more things when we consider good works. What it could be. We need to continue to talk about good works, consider our deficiencies out of love of God and love for our neighbor. So how do they do that, Pastor Bullhagen? Well, the, the Ten Commandments. Okay. All right. One thing I'll one thing I'll mention later is too. We should be talking about this in our sermons. Yep. Something that Lutheran pastors sometimes are a little afraid to do. Mm-hmm. You know. And where else? Uh, if they wanted to go to the small catechism. Uh, by daily contrition and repentance, drown the old Adam, and also the Ten Commandments. Yep. And also the. Table of duties. Table of duties, yes. Right? You know, and uh, I don't know. Hannah, please post those on our uh, Facebook page <laughs> since I'm no longer on Facebook. <laughs> All right. Uh, what it could be. Um, gaining a deeper understanding of the gospel really helps us understand the motivation for good works. And the, I think the clearest expression of this is is in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Where do we learn to forgive? How do we understand forgiveness? It's through the forgiveness we have through God and his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. What it could be. um, uh, Pastors need to be unafraid to preach good works so we understand from the Bible what good works actually are. And um, as a pastor, I, I remember when I was a younger pastor, I was a little bit more, you know, not likely to do it as much, nervous about it, because I didn't want to sound like a pietist. But, I mean, you just read Paul's epistles, for example. Right. <laughs> His letters. What was he concerned about? Well, he was concerned about all the things we are, but he also dealt a lot about good works. Right. Yeah, definitely, you know, and and even uh, that uh, uh, encouragement toward it too, you mm-hmm. know, uh, that's part of the text from Romans here that I'm going to preach on. Uh, Let us walk properly as in the daytime, verse uh, 13 here, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Yeah, you know, and this is. Paul encouraging them, you know, to uh, uh, to continue in uh, the good works that uh, that God has laid out for them. Um, yeah, and then my my uh, my closing comment about good works is at that we are in our good works uh, both deficient and complete at the same time. What do I mean by that, Vicar? I mean, we're deficient because as a sinful human still on this side of eternity and on Judgment Day, we're still 
going to be living in our sin. We're going to be still wishing to do our, you know, do a good work for selfish gain. Right. But as a a redeemed child of God, we've been made complete through Christ. Right. And so through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, that good work that we get to do is a good work because it's done in faith. All right, gentlemen, do you have anything to add about this this brief little discussion on good works? I was thinking of the difference between justification and sanctification, uh, two great big words, I know, but uh, you know, your justification is sure. Jesus died for the sins of the world. Believe it, it's true. And uh, that is completely and totally sure. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It is just true. Believe it. Um, and... Uh, and your sanctification is all messed up, <laughs> but in Christ, it is, it is sure as well. Uh, and uh, there will be a day when we will be you know, holy before, before the Lord, uh, and, uh, and these good works will be shown to have been done not by us, but by God through us. And that's, that's it. That's good. And he still rewards them. And he still rewards them. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Purely out of his grace. Yeah. All right, so one, I just want to, we have a brief news at Bothersburg. I want to get it in because it was offered to us by a listener. Play the intro, Peter. <laughs> there's fake news, there's real news, then there's real news that Berg wishes was fake. It's time to hear news that bothers Berg. Yeah, so we have a listener submitted news that bothers Berg this week. Comes from Cheryl. And, uh,. There's no article or anything. It's just a uh, Facebook video. Those Facebook videos are the worst. Advent wine calendar. I think, I don't know. I'm. It sounds like, I'm guessing you're a fan. Yeah, I, I'm not, like, that's actually pretty rad. I, I mean, I would replace the wine with, like, whiskey, but, you know. Um, yeah, no, it's. Uh, well, if, if you look at it, though, if you look at the video, though, it's there's nothing adventy about it. No, no, it's just it's, it's yeah, just more of an encouragement to make sure you drink every day so that you become an alcoholic, <laughs> whether you're alone or with friends. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and yeah, Advent is kind of a time we probably should be uh, right fasting a little bit because what's um, what's a, it's just the picture of what food? I can't even tell what that is. Yeah, they look like Christmas egg rolls. Yeah, <laughs> to me. And it just says "Merry Christmas." There's nothing really Advent. See, see, I, I it actually does bother me in the sense of it just makes Advent okay. Christmas is coming. Drink wine and celebrate each yep, day before each. Can, can we also talk about the fact that there's only 24 bottles in there? No, that that's what an Advent calendar does. They don't put you don't have something special for Christmas. Well, I don't know. Well, I'm not sure. Then you go and get a big bottle. Yeah, you, yeah, you, 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 buy, you, buy, that, you buy that separate. Right. I've never really done an advent calendar, but it seems like you should have 25 days. See, advent calendars are really cool. Like, yeah. they uh, they they can be really really neat. Where uh, they 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 tell uh, the history of of Christmas, and it's something fun you can do with your kids. And um, yeah, growing up, we had what's called a Jesse tree. Which is like an advent calendar, but there's like this little, little um, symbol that you pull out of the, the the pocket and you put on the on the Christmas tree every uh, every day of Advent, and uh, basically, you know, it, it it tells the entire the entire uh, uh, salvation history from the fall into sin all the way up to Christ's second coming, which is pretty awesome. That is pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would I would say that bothered me. But it wasn't the alcohol. Right. Mm-hmm. If you could have a Jesse tree with bottles of wine, I'd be for it. Sure. Definitely. But but to me, it's like, like get ready for Christmas by building up your tolerance to alcohol. <laughs> right. No, and that that is. There's there's an issue there. I mean, <laughs> because uh, a lot of the epistle lessons for Advent are like, don't get drunk on wine. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's true, too. <laughs> and, and you're, you know... Once again, it's just, you know, there's the world has no time for Advent. It has no time for repentance. Uh, Christmas, I mean, because who wants to be, you know, anti-family, right? It's, uh, 
the world just has co-opted this and turned it into, I don't know, I guess I'm just kind of... Well, I, I think what, what people, bit. listener, if you're, for us to really under, wrap our head around this, I think maybe if you sent Pastor Berg one of those and we can actually review it and see. Yeah, um, you know, uh, we, 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 uh, we're, we're, we would do that for the yeah, show. We, we would uh, take one for the team, you know. Maybe we'd get it all done before Advent. <laughs> we can, we can have an Advent calendar show where we, we go through the entire ad- <laughs> Advent calendar show. It'd be amazing. But no, uh, listener too, if you guys are interested in um, Advent calendars or Jesse trees or whatever, uh, maybe shoot us a message. Maybe we can help you try find something because it's really this is a great time to teach your kids what Advent is. Uh, through, in kind of a playful way. So, all right, and and this is ep- airing uh, uh, on the day after Thanksgiving. So why don't we close the show with by mentioning something that we're all thankful for? <laughs> I'm thankful for you guys. Thanks a bunch for what you do. I've got to. I th- I'm thankful for Jesus. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that, Peter. That's been my go-to for 24 years. I am thankful to uh, Hannah, our associate producer, and Peter, our producer. Vicar? I'm thankful the episode is almost over. (laughs) I'm thankful that we're able to uh, meet and do this again. Yeah. uh, After a long hiatus, so... All right. Well, thank you for listening to our show. Uh, I am Bullhagen. I'm Berg. I'm Vicar. And I'm Bert. And may your works be good. By faith. (laughs) Thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Questions, thoughts, concerns? You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clerical heirs podcast on Twitter at clerical heirs P for podcast or email us at feedback at clerical Thanks for listening to clerical heirs. See you next time.